Thanks everyone for coming, I really appreciate it. My name is Elijah Meeks, I'm here at Stanford. I'm in the library. Uh, um, my position title is Digital Humanities Specialist, so I am the person to answer this question, <laughs> what is Digital Humanities? The most special. The most, well, I, I'm specialized in answering this question. Um, and so I'm going to take 10 minutes to answer this question, which is great because people have been arguing about, about it for the last five or 10 or 50 years, depending on who you talk to. Um, we're also going to get talks by uh, Glenn Worthy, who's going to give more of a historical grounding of what digital humanities has meant and, and what, who's been practicing it. We're going to see, uh, we're also going to get a talk from, from Camille Vila. Am I pronouncing your last name right? Vila. Vila. Uh, about what kind of digital humanities projects are going on at Berkeley. We're all going to get a couple of, of presenters, Jason Sundrum and Andrew. Andrew. And just Andrew, um, who are going to present on, uh, on Haydn, and Alicia Leo, who's going to present more on, what would you call it, cultural criticism, social commentary? Uh, yeah, let's go with social commentary. Right. I've got, I've got my own name for it that we'll see in a Venn diagram. Um, <laughs> probably a worse name. That's good. So, to get started and answer this question of what is the digital humanities or what is digital humanities, first of all, uh, I'm going to give an answer. I'm going to give maybe a couple of answers. And these are contested answers, so I want that to be clear from the very start. Uh, one of my favorite answers um, is, is this one, bringing computational methods to bear on traditional humanities scholarship. And that sounds really good. We use GIS. Um, which is spatial analysis, we use network analysis, uh, text analysis, or natural language processing to study philosophy and literature and the classics, and that sounds like a really clean and glib definition. Um, it also is amenable to another clean and glib definition. Um, we use tools that were developed to do things like drop bombs and find oil and spy on you, and we use them to study literature, we use them to, to spy on Voltaire and to <laughs> figure out the shape of Poland in the 17th century and otherwise study philosophy, history, uh, literature, and the classics. And that is very much what I do here at Stanford for the most part, is use computational methods in the exploration of traditional humanities scholarship. So network analysis, this is network analysis, this is a, a screenshot from Geffy um, where we're looking at the 30,000 people who make up Kindred Britain, one of the projects I've worked on. Um, a transportation network model of the Roman world, we called it Orbis. It's uh, interactive and it's been sometimes called the Google Maps of the Roman Empire, uh, which ignores some of the really cool stuff that it does that Google Maps can't do. Um, again, network analysis, uh, uh, a small project I did to study TV tropes and the shape of TV tropes and how different works in TV tropes are connected to each other by shared uh, tropes, they refer to them as. Um, ma mapping the Grand Tour up on the top right there, that's a project from three or four years ago. Another project looking at species biodiversity databases as literature and trying to examine how scientists write entries in species biodiversity databases. So very much computational methods brought to bear on traditional humanities questions. Um, it's not really what digital humanities is. It's one thing that digital humanities is. Really, digital humanities is an approach that resembles science that isn't science because science comes from a background or from a basis of skepticism. Whereas scholarship in the humanities comes from a basis of criticism. And those might seem similar because the results could build upon each other. The results of critical inquiry could seem like the results of sort of skeptical inquiry in the sciences. But the sciences are focused on progression, building better things to build off of, understanding things better so you can build things again. Whereas in the humanities, it's focused on critique and engaging in a, an agonistic or dialectical engagement with a thing. So presenting from the traditional dialectical, the sort of cereal box dialectic, which is uh, synthesis, um, I'm sorry, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right, this idea of going back and forth with, with examining a thing. And I think that it's this idea of critical inquiry that is what defines digital humanities. And so it's critical inquiry brought to bear on things that we think of as modern digital things. So critical inquiry, we're familiar with critical inquiry being applied to 
digital objects, and we've called that new media for quite some time. And I think we're growing more and more familiar with critical inquiry being applied to these worlds that exist around the world of computational methods. This is what I think Alicia, this is the, the area where I think she sits. Um, and I call it disrupt hacker culture because of course tech is always talking about disrupting things. But instead it's critical inquiry being used to disrupt um, the culture that's been developed around computational methods. Uh, software studies, this is an interesting field if you're not aware of it, so um, Lev Manovich is one, of the, is one of the scholars in software studies. And what's interesting is that Lev Manovich, along with talking about software studies, oftentimes uh, talks about DH. And so it sort of supports that it's this border region with what digital humanities is. And I think most interesting is this other area, fan culture. Uh, I called it crowdsourcing in the first draft of this. There's a lot of different terms for it. I like to call it interloping. It's the idea that someone who is not an expert in a particular field is allowed to now go and do things in another field. That's why I put data journalism here, because that's what data journalists are doing. They're now taking methods that used to be, quote, only deployed by experts, right? Like network analysis and spatial analysis, and they're applying them to journalism. There's also another interesting little area here called NEO, and that's what I like to think of as NEO-geography and NEO-topology. It's the application of network analysis or network science and spatial analysis or GI science uh, to questions by people who are not PhDs in geography or PhDs in network science. And, you know, Wikipedia and TV tropes is very much fan culture. Right, TV tropes, obviously, a bunch of people who are fans of everything, apparently, <laughs> including Gilgamesh and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, all relating them to each other by shared tropes. But Wikipedia also, fans of this sort of old 1950s sense of knowledge that maybe we can put together an encyclopedia that finally explains everything that everyone can agree on. Um, I want to remind people, so, and then the DH area. Right, this DH neighborhood that has to do with bringing computational methods to bear on traditional humanities questions. Traditional humanities questions being a lens, not a subject, because of course social scientists and sociophysicists all study human beings, so it's not the study of human beings. Um, but I want to remind you that Venn diagrams are not the best method for explaining information. So when you look at this Venn diagram, the previous Venn diagram, even though I neatly organized it so that it was the intersection of various things and you can see these, these nice neighborhoods, uh, remember the things that are missing. Right, take that critical eye toward it. And I think most especially what's missing from this is pedagogy. And that's really missing from digital humanities, I think. Uh, we see a lot of disruption in the academy as far as pedagogy and learning technology goes. We see very little overlap between digital humanities and learning technology and pedagogy or MOOCs or hybrid classrooms or any of these other um, advances or, or, like I said, I used the word disruption, I shouldn't have. Um, in pedagogy. So even though it's very easy to, to arrange something and make it look like it's, it's the right arrangement of things, the many people in this room who have experience with data visualization know that this is problematic. It's the knowledge that this is problematic and that this is an offering and not an answer, I think, that defines humanities scholarship and the sort of what digital scholarship involving this humanities lens is roughly speaking, what digital humanities is. And if I had my druthers, I'd start painting DH on a lot of these different things. And that's why I think it makes sense that um, Alicia is here talking about something that uh, some people think isn't part of digital humanities. And a lot of people who are, quote, doing digital humanities are talking about those same things.